I am really, really, really glad that you're here today. And I am genuinely excited about our Christmas Eve service on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. And I hope that you have invited family and friends that will join you, that will be here. Um, it's going to be a special service. And this is a time of year when guests like to come. They, they want to come to church. So let us not miss out on this opportunity to, to share the amazing love of Jesus Christ. And so an easy way is to invite family and friends and neighbors and co-workers to join you on Christmas Eve here at the fort, 6 p.m. I've invited my neighbors, and I hope that you will do the same. I love Christmas, and I have loved through this series exploring with you the impact of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, on our past, on our present. And today, I especially want to talk with you about our future. Look up at the screen, this picture. The man in the middle of that picture is a man named Eugene Lang. He passed away back in 2017. He was a very wealthy industrialist. Well, this picture was taken back in 1991 in Harlem. That's where he grew up. And so, some years earlier, he had gone to this little elementary school where he had grown up, and he was going to give to the students at the elementary school the typical talk that young people get to hear from people like him. Try hard and, and study, and, and you can be all that you can be. Well, as he began to, to speak to this class in Harlem, he realized that's not true. Most of these children don't have the resources to go and try to achieve their deepest and greatest dreams. So he, he kind of went off script and he did something outlandish. And he said to those young kids that day, every one of you that graduates from high school and wants to go to college, I will pay for it. Well, the principal took him aside and he said, you can't, you can't do that because over 75% of these children are not even going to finish school. Well, that picture right there was taken with that class of kids and over 75% of them did finish high school and over 50% of them did go on to college. And the moral of the story is hope is a powerful thing. That's why we like redemption stories, because redemption stories dare to suggest that the future doesn't have to be chained to our past. And that is especially powerful in this Christmas story that we have been examining these past few weeks. We have been looking at Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol, and I want to revisit our story. Remember, this month, December, marks the 176th year since it was first published. This story resonates with all of us because Dickens wrote this story to speak to his time because in his time, the poor were being marginalized. There were abhorrent child labor practices. And Dickens was looking for a way to say, are we going to continue the way that it is? Are we going to try to actually strive for a better future? So instead of writing a tale of rebuke, he wrote a tale of redemption. And the person needing redeeming in his story is, of course, Ebenezer Scrooge. And we've met Ebenezer over the last couple of weeks. He's a miserly old money lender who is wealthy and uncaring and isolated from people. And he hates Christmas because in his mind, Christmas gets in the way of business. But as the story unfolds, Scrooge has been visited now by spirits, the ghost of Christmas past and the ghost of Christmas present. And they have opened Scrooge's eyes to the reality that his wealth has kept him from actually seeing. And he's beginning to wonder if perhaps he has not pursued what his true life's business ought to be. But nothing is going to shake Scrooge like this final visit, the ghost of Christmas future. And in the book, this ghost never speaks. 
but he sends the most powerful message of all. The first place the ghost takes Scrooge is to some businessmen having a conversation and Scrooge knows who they are and they're talking about someone that has died and they're asking each other the question, are you going to go to the funeral? And they all agree, well, probably not. Who would want to go to his funeral anyway? And Scrooge is perplexed. That's a rather calloused attitude. Well, then we see a handmaid that has gone into the home of the deceased and has taken some of the things. And now she's trying to sell these things to a fence. And again, Scrooge is perplexed at such rude behavior. And you can see in Scrooge, as he's pondering, why are people so unfeeling? Why is there so lacking in compassion? Why, why, is, why are they not caring about who this dead person is? The Spirit is about to let him know. And the Spirit takes Scrooge to a cemetery. And the Spirit points to a particular plot. And Scrooge goes and he wipes the snow off of the gravestone and he sees his own name. And that is when it comes flooding into his consciousness that he is going to die rich and unmourned. He will die wealthy and unloved. He's going to have lived an affluent life and nobody's going to care about the fact that he's gone. And Scrooge looks at the spirit and he pleads this incredibly powerful question. Are these shadows of things to come that will be or just may be? Now, I haven't finished the story, but I got to get preaching here. <laughs> I think that... It is such an amazing gospel-centered question that Scrooge asks. Are these shadows of things to come that will be or just may be? You see, Scrooge has experienced future shock. And he wants to know if he can change the trajectory of his life. And so he asks the question that is crucial to any good story. And frankly, it's crucial in all of our lives. He asks this, is the future fixed or can it be fixed? He's looking for the same thing that we're all looking for. Hope. He wants to know if the future has to be a certain way or can it be a different way? Is the future flexible, pliable, changeable? Now, how you answer that question depends on what your overarching narrative or worldview is. If you are a naturalist and you think this whole Christmas story is absurd, guiding stars, hosts of angels, virgin birth, and that doesn't fit your paradigm, well, if that's your worldview, it has consequences. And one of them is when you get asked the question, is the future fixed or can it be fixed? You say, well, no, it can't. The future is simply the inevitable outcome of things as they evolve in a cause and effect universe. In fact, even your thought is an illusion. You just think you have thoughts of your own choice, but it's just neurons in your brain falling like dominoes over each other. They, they only do exactly what they're programmed to do. In fact, a naturalist would, would say, not only can you not fix the future, but why do you even care? Because the reality is you are just a cosmic accident. You're not even supposed to be here. The universe could not care less that you even exist. Friend, I'm not a naturalist. I believe in guiding stars, hosts of angels, and a virgin birth. I believe Christmas is a rebuke to naturalism. It is the message of a God who has supernaturally entered our world to make possible the experience for all of us of a better future. Christmas is heaven declaring to us the future can indeed be fixed. I heard a story recently of a doctor who is a pediatric neurosurgeon in Halifax, Nova Scotia. 
The reason I knew about him is because he tweeted a most amazing conversation he had with a young patient. He has an eight-year-old boy named Jackson. Jackson has a cyst on his brain, and he's suffering from a chronic hydrocephalus. And he had to do this very delicate surgery to remove fluid from his brain. And so he's speaking to the little boy to calm his fears beforehand. And the little boy asks him a question that he has never been asked before. He pulls out his little teddy bear and he, he has a big rip under his arm. And he said, while you're fixing me, can you fix him? What's he going to say? So the doctor does this very delicate surgery on this boy. And before the nurses can leave, he puts the little teddy bear on the table and he stitches it up. So when little Jackson wakes up, he's handed his bear and his bear is fixed. And that is a powerful message to young Jackson that he's fixed too. That's what Christmas does. It is the message that because Jesus came, a, a new future can come. In fact, a new future is coming. You see, because Jesus came, a new reality is present. The old ball player Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. That's really good theology, my friend. The birth of Jesus means the death of same old, same old. Jesus did not enter this world to leave it like he found it. Revelation 21, verse 5, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. These are trustworthy words and true. I want you to understand that, that what God is going to finish at the second coming of Jesus, he started at his first coming. He has started making things new. He has started repairing the future. You see, in Jesus' day, there were two ways to look at the future. One way was the old Roman or Latin word futurum. Futurum says the future is just the natural outcome of things as they evolve from the past. Now, the second view said the future is, is open to something or someone breaking into and changing how things would be otherwise. Let me illustrate it. You, you go to a doctor and you're diagnosed with an aggressive cancer and the doctor says to you, we know how this cancer evolves, we know what your health history is, so here is what this means for your future. This and this and this will be the outcome. That is futurum. But what if the doctor said, we have recently been made aware of a brand new treatment drug that is having a powerful impact on the particular type of cancer that you have. Would you be interested in trying something new that could potentially change what would otherwise be a set outcome? Or say you go to your church and you ask your elders to anoint you with oil and pray over you and ask for supernatural healing. That is a different way to look at the future. You know, you know what the old Roman or Latin word for that is? Adventus. Advent. That's what Christians all over the world are celebrating right now. Advent celebrates God breaking into our history. And it anticipates that God is going to do that again for us. We are Advent people, not Futurum people. We are people that believe that God has come and that a new reality is present. And what that means is things don't have to stay the way they are. Status quo does not win. You don't have to see history repeat itself. And nobody has to continue to remain the person that they used to be. You see, Advent people have hope that because of the coming of Christ, birth has been given through possibility of a new future. 
Now, if you're a naturalist and, and you don't believe this story, I can accept that. I don't agree with you, but I can accept that's how you see the world. That's what you think. Here's what I don't understand. I don't understand a person that would say, I do believe this story, but then they live like the story is a myth. I don't understand people who say guiding stars and hosts of angels and a virgin birth are believable, but then they live like that has never happened. And they continue to step into the future like nothing will ever get better. How many of you, for just my knowledge, went for this Christmas and bought someone a gift card to a restaurant or a department store? Do you know why merchants love for you to do this? Because recently, the Harvard Business Review revealed in the last several years, there is 41 billion unused gift cards out there. $41 billion worth, I should say, of unused gift cards that exist. Now, why would anybody do that? Why would anyone get a gift and then not redeem it? I don't believe that. I will prove that to you. You give me a gift card. <laughs> I believe in redemption. I promise I'll use that sucker. Why would anyone say, I believe that in Jesus Christ, God has given us the gift of a new future, and they would not redeem that. Not want to step into that. You see, because Jesus came, a new life is possible. Redemption is more than just being released from the guilt of my past. Redemption is being set free to release who we were created to be going forward. The reality of the present doesn't have to be the only possibility for the future. Jesus was born that we might be born again. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Look at what Mary read at the beginning of our, script, our service today. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has come, has, has gone. The new has come. That's Adventus. I believe Christ can be formed in anyone, just as he was in Mary. It is true, Christmas is about spending. It's about spending your life on a completely new path. And that's what makes the story of Ebenezer Scrooge so inspiring. Scrooge experiences redemption. That was Dickens' plan. Dickens could have ended the story, so Scrooge died a miserable old man, and nobody remembered him the end. And we wouldn't be seeing plays or movies of a story like that. He could have ended the story, don't be like Scrooge. But that gives no one hope. So I have to tell you how the story ends. Scrooge wakes back up in his room after this powerful experience in the graveyard. And he literally falls to his knees and begins to repent. And he begins to beg for the opportunity to create a different future. And he falls into a deep sleep, but he wakes up the next morning and he's thrilled that he's alive. He's been given one more day to live. And he goes to the window and he shouts out at a passerby, what day is it? Well, it's Christmas day. And he's so excited. He is going to fulfill his pledge to be a new man. He says, I'm not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been. The first thing he does is he purchases the largest turkey he can buy, and he sends it to the home of Bob Cratchit. And remember, he, he scoffed and he scorned at the opportunity to help the poor. Well, he finds those men that were raising money for the charity, and he makes a large donation with joy and with eagerness. And then he goes to his nephew's Christmas party. <coughs> he has a wonderful time. He embraces people. He's determined that his future now will be full of love, full of community. And then at the very end of the book, 
It's the next to the last paragraph in the book. We read these words. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. You see what Dickens has done? He's telling the entire nation that he's writing to, let's all be like Scrooge. Let's build a better future. You see, the best stories are redemption stories, including yours. And God wants you to have one. And, and I know that there are a lot of people outside of these walls that have given up hope on God. That's why you going and giving these out is a really good thing to do. But you need to know God is never, ever going to give hope up for you. God wants you to be a part of his redemption story. God wants me. God wants us. In fact, God wants everything. You see, because Jesus came, a new world is coming. Jesus came to redeem everything. He came to reverse the curse. And Christmas declares God gets exactly what he wants. This world is not Satan's. This world is God's. And it is destined for shalom. When you hear Hebrew people say to each other, shalom, it doesn't just mean the absence of war. It means the world in harmony. It means Eden restored. It means the world the way it was before sin corrupted it. Jesus came so that the world that God wants can come. And when Jesus comes back, it's not going to mean the end of the world. It's going to mean the beginning of the world, the way God meant for it to be. And this is what the prophets saw. This is, this is what they longed for. Isaiah wrote, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. An amazing thing happens at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue every time an administration changes. So this will happen again for us in 2024. The current president, and the family will get into a limousine and they will go to the inauguration. And everything in the White House living quarters will be left just exactly like it was. And in less than five hours, it will undergo a complete transformation. New pictures will be hung on the walls. New clothes will be put into the closets. Even the next president's toothbrush will be set on the counter in the bathroom by the sink. It is a foretaste of what it will be like when Jesus comes back. And let me tell you, it, it's not going to take God five hours to transform this world. The Bible says everything will burn. Not because God is destroying the world, but because God is purging the world so that Jesus can come back as Lord and King to the world that he originally created. And it's going to happen because God is Lord of the future. And Christmas is God's pledge and promise that he is going to fix it. By the way, that is one of the functions of our worship. It is why it is so important that you make coming to church every single week a priority. Because during the week, whether, whether you realize this or not, you are bombarded by all the other narratives about what really matters. They tell you what really matters is how much power you amass. What really matters is how much wealth you acquire. And these things need to stay the way they are. But when we come together and we take bread and we drink wine 
and we read the scriptures and we hear preaching and we sing songs and we pray prayers, we tell a bigger and a better story than the world does. I, I love the songs. Some people like old songs. Some people like new songs. I like good songs. I like songs that speak the deep truths of God. And Christmas songs do this so especially well. They give hope for the future. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. O oh, come, desire of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. O oh, bid our sad divisions cease, and be yourself our king of peace. I, I like all of them, but if, if you're going to force me to pick one, it would probably be this one. O oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. The thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. That's what we remember when we come together in worship. That is exactly what Christmas does. You see, Christmas, Christmas gives birth to hope in the future. And, and when, when I say hope, I'm not talking about positive thinking. Hope is not positive thinking about what I can do. Hope is positive faith in what God is going to do. And I am a person of hope. I believe in Christmas. I know you do too. So I am begging you to stop living like this story is a myth. Stop saying that you believe it and then living like it never happened. Jesus was born of a virgin. He did come. He did take away our sins. He died and he was put into the grave. He defeated the grave. He's returning again. You and I should be hope dealers, sharing the story, giving good news, letting people know the future can be fixed. Last year in 2018, John McCain passed away. You may not have liked his politics, but anyone who had spent over five years as a prisoner of war and then comes back to our country, not bitter, but determined to serve our country, earns my respect. It's 1969. He's in a POW camp in North Vietnam. He has been in solitary confinement. He's been tortured. But he said his lowest moment was Christmas Eve. And the Viet Cong are playing a song over the loudspeaker, I'll be home for Christmas. And then he heard this tapping on his cell wall. And the cell next to him was Ernie Bruce, a Marine. And the prisoners had learned this little code of tapping to communicate with each other. And Ernie was tapping the message, we will all be home for Christmas. God bless America. That's what he needed. He needed hope. He needed to know that the future was not chained to the past. We do too. I want you to believe in God's future, and I want you to believe it so much that it powerfully impacts how you live right now in the present. So let me close today by reading to you the very last sentence of Charles Dickens' book. It says this, It was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. 
May that truly be said of all of us. And as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. Everyone. Stand up, I want to pray over you.